Welcome to the eighth of the video lesson. Something you don't know, but it's a re-recording for me since the last one didn't actually record the sound. So, following on from last lesson, where we looked at the chronology of the presidential government and therefore was very focused on the actions of the elites, we are now going to turn this into a paragraph. Essentially, a paragraph which explains how, extent, nature, the elites can be held responsible for the destruction of Weimar, Germany. So, before we focus on specific members of the elites, specific individuals like the three chancellors we see here, we need to focus on what kind of roles, what actions does this um, the elites have in helping Hitler come to power. Well, there are several ways the elites could help. The first one is support. So they can either support electorally, that's voting or bringing a number of groups or people to to give their support to give their votes to um uh the nazis and that's probably the smallest because elites by their very nature are quite small in number there's also financially we will see there are certain organizations particularly amongst industrialists who do a long way to finance the nazi party now while that doesn't directly get them votes you can argue that nazi machine as we shall see is very expensive all that propaganda all those gal lighters all that local support all those sa members needing to be given beer money they are incredibly expensive yet they're also highly effective to get votes and you can argue therefore without money the um, nazi campaign would be far less effective so you can argue that the financial support of the elites was essential to keep the nazi machine going and therefore keep their vote up you can also argue that the elites act as lobbyists lobbyists are people who speak to persuade cajole people in power to accept something or change something in this case they persuade hindenburg and to a lesser extent the chancellors that hitler is a viable person to give power to. This is a particular case among certain key individuals, like the advisors, the military Prussian Juncker advisors around Hindenburg, uh, and as well as that um, von Papen and Schleicher, but mostly von Papen. We can also argue that elites are guilty of acquiescing to Nazis by essentially accepting the Nazis' illegal seizure of power to some extent. Um, and that while they don't actively support it, they don't stand in the way. And many of whom you could argue that the courts or royal uh, army, in theory, could or maybe should, or well, that's more disputable. Um, and I would say for every, most, pretty much all elites acquiesce to this, part either because they see the... Um, uh, Nazi Party is a lesser of two evils, or because they are prepared to follow Hindenburg, who does have their implicit trust. And finally, we can say how the elites enable Hitler come to come to power on the most simple level. Without the elites, i.e., Hindenburg, there's no way Hitler would become Chancellor. It doesn't matter if you have the highest number of votes in this in the presidential government, because if you think about it, Hindenburg is the person who picks who gets chancellorship and he Hindenburg is the one who gives article 48 to that chancellor von Papen has no electoral support at all and yet is chancellor so in reality you, you have to have Hindenburg if you want to be given the um, right to um, be chancellor remember that the Nazi vote goes down but despite that um, the Hitler is not offered the position of chancellor in 1932 but in 1933, when the vote is lower, he is. So clearly, the elites have a role in that. And finally, you can argue that the elites, and probably the biggest one, do stuff which enables the Nazis to continue to operate, to continue to use violence, to continue to um, gain support, or do stuff which help them succeed. They persuade, they make it easier to do something, they help in some way. And in reality, a lot of the elites fall into this bracket. They do stuff which, even if they don't necessarily love the Nazis, they they like their aims, or at least they tolerate their aims enough because they hate communism, or they support Hindenburg, or they support the right, and that's not too far away from their point of view, um, enough in order to gain support. So they will use their powers to aid and help the Nazis. So let's go through first the core members of the elite, the um, the chancellors and Hindenburg and basically discuss how each can be blamed or held responsible for Hitler coming to power. So the first one is Brüning and he's the one with the hardest job to try and persuade or argue that he's in, um, he is responsible for Hitler's rise to power. So what I'm going to do is divide each of these men into two camps. The arguments that they can't be blamed at the top and those that, that he can be blamed. So 
let's focus on Bruning first. We can point out that in reality, and what we're going to sell Bruning as, is a man who fundamentally doesn't buy into Hitler, doesn't actually want to see the end of democracy. He is the head of a large democratic party, after all, but is forced by circumstance to adopt certain measures and is basically compelled to by the people with the real power, i.e. Hindenburg and von Papen, to act in a certain way. And as soon as he doesn't, he is kicked out so therefore anything that's blamed on him is actually hindenburg's fault because it's hindenburg who ultimately uses article 48 to keep him in power and has the puppet the strings to the puppet that is bruning he is this puppet who doesn't actually hate democracy but he's following hindenburg's league um the attack against him will be actually while he does not directly help hitler come to power his incompetence at managing the great depression creates the, the continued economic hardship which means and encourages the Nazi vote to increase. So although he does not directly help the Nazis come to power, his incompetence indirectly makes it easier for the Nazis to gain support and therefore hit to come to power. So let's go through these arguments. So first things first, Bruning, everything Bruning does has to have Article 48 and Hindenburg. And as we saw last lesson, as soon as Bruning really upsets Hindenburg, he loses office. So in reality, you can argue Bruning's policy is far more authoritarian, far more right wing than Bruning actually wants. But because he's held hostage to the Article 48 of Hindenburg, he will only get laws passed, decrees passed, which actually make um, Hindenburg happy, which are therefore naturally going to be far more right wing. We can also argue that he is dealing with an economic crisis which most countries, Britain, America, etc., by 1932, really haven't succeeded at dealing with. So although we might blame him for being the hunger chancellor, no other real country has really solved this issue either. And therefore, in reality, he's dealing with his bad situation the best he can. Um, and also point out that back on the back of that, the other chances from Papen and Schleicher don't deal with the Depression either that well. There is a counter to that that they weren't in for nearly as long, but still. We can also point out that Brunin cannot really deal with the entrenched power of the elites, the fact that the rich have all the power and they helped Hitler. They've been in power well before Brunin, so there's nothing he can do. He has to dance to their games. We can also point out that Brunin is one of the few leader of a party, he's leader of the centre party. He does have a coalition of parties under them. The centre party is the only significant one, but still, we can point out he is a legitimate leader. He is a democratic leader, and he does clearly believe in democracy to some extent. So therefore, actually, we could say he is not this von Papen-esque, anti-democratic, crass political figure who just is in it for himself. He genuinely believes in democracy. That's why he's the party leader. But he's been forced out of this democratic mould because of circumstance. So, we can also argue that he only has to uh, uh, rely on Article 48 and Hindenburg because Reichstag isn't doing its job. The only way he can get laws passed is not for Reichstag with the communists and the Nazis getting a significant chunk of the vote and therefore narrowing the percentage of pro-democratic parties, none of whom will work together. It's impossible to get laws through. So he has to rely on Hindenburg. So it's not Bruning's fault the, the political case to play uh, the political system is a disaster it is um hindenburg's or it is reichstag's fault for forcing hindenburg to be in we can also point out that bruning does ban the sa he does um try and stem the violence and it's von papen who undoes that so clearly he's not trying to enable hitler likewise he isn't even though he's having to dance hindenburg's tune you can see his unhappiness with the elites you can see his unhappiness with the status quo because he does do these anti-elite reforms um, and then we can say, therefore, actually, he's forced into his authoritarian um, attitudes and his in incompetence, his poor decision, deflationary policies dealing with depression because of the elites. Because as soon as he does these anti-elite reforms, the land reform, he is kicked from office. And we can also point out that compared to anyone else, in reality, Bruning probably represents the slight consensus of Germans. Most Germans are politically and culturally conservative. Bruning was particularly culturally and conservative. Most Germans were suspicious but fundamentally would buy in to democracy like him. He's not extremely authoritarian. He's not extremely communist. He represents a centre-right Catholic conservative opinion, which actually is very close to the average German, at least the average non-city German. And therefore actually he's more legitimate because he does represent the people so if we're going to blame brooming and his policy and his attitude and his approach he does represent the people he does stand for the people so should we blame brooning or the or the people so if we're going to sum up all of those essentially we're saying brooning isn't the, is just a puppet he is not the puppet master any mistakes are not him 
The Bruning is having to deal with a terrible situation, which very hard, it's very hard to deal with, and no one else deals with. Bruning is dealing with a dysfunctional Reichstag, so has very few options, and he does try and do things the right way, but he is frustrated by the elites. So what's the arguments against them? Because this is a fairly credible series of arguments. Well, we can point out that he does uh, pursue a deflationary policy. That's cuts and limitations in spending. He approaches it through orthodox economics, um, which is the idea that the balance should be budget. The budget should be balanced. Um, what that causes, essentially, is more people to lose jobs, which requires even more people to lose, uh, even less demands for factories, even less demand for goods, which then makes more people um, unemployed, which in turn then makes less people have less demand and so on and generally in depressions what you want to do is stimulate the economy to some extent not by doing cuts we could also point out that his poor handling um then led to more people getting votes and more people voting for the kpd and the um uh nazis and as we can see between 19 um 30 and 1932 there's a massive increase in both party support and we can argue therefore the shift in extremism helps hitler come to power because in reality what we can say is because um, uh, the, the, the Nazis increase in power, they're more likely to be brought on board by the right-wing uh, elite because they are a viable popular support behind their authoritarian dictatorship. Always remember that the, I mentioned this before, but always remember that the elites, very few of them actually respect or like Hitler. They see him as a tool. They have a problem. They represent maximum 5 to 10% of the population. And they want a government of the elite, the 5 to 10%. But naturally, in, a, in Germany, with a democracy, people don't necessarily want that. They want their view heard. So you need to have control, a government, but give people the illusion that actually it has popular legitimacy. It has support from some sections of the people. And the idea is, therefore, to have a government controlled by the elites, but with the Nazis tagging along as part of a coalition, bringing... 30-40% of the vote and therefore rounding up to about 40-45% of the vote supporting the government and therefore making it look democratically legitimate. So, um, we can argue therefore that because of his failure to deal with it, this makes the Nazis more legitimate and more likely to be taken on by Hindenburg. We can also point out that the, incre the corresponding increase in the Marxists as a result of the hunger chancellor then further gives urgency to the elites. They get If you have a communist party of 1%, you're not going to fear it. If you have a communist party of 20-25%, there's the fear that there's going to be a revolution is much greater. And in that fear, two things happen. More people join the Nazi party, okay, and more people... Um, will join um, the, more people will also in the, in the elite in the DMVP see the Nazis as a less worse option if they are more alarmed of the communist threat then they will want to side with Hitler against the communists he has the SA he has popular support he has ideas against them so they're more likely to go you know what he's not that bad let's make him chancellor we can also point this is um, supporters Hindenburg say this had um, Bruning persuaded Hitler to not run in the election, the presidential election 32, then um, the Nazis wouldn't look legitimate. They wouldn't look like a grown-up party. But the fact that Hitler was able to run and gain so many votes made the Nazis look like more of a, of a viable political force and made them more politically strong. I would say that's a little bit unreasonable because it's hard to expect Bruning should be able to persuade Hitler of anything. Um, we can also point out that his action, um, his decision to do the crazy idea of land reform unnecessarily it was obviously going to fail unnecessarily angers the Junkers and makes the Junkers increasingly believe that democracy doesn't happen and isn't going to work and they point to Bruning as if democracy was going to work it would be through Bruning and the fact that he proposes something as crazy as land reform suggests that actually what we need is authoritarianism and it's the acceptance of the idea that we need to move to a more authoritarian more crazy sort of right wing more controlled system which means they, they increasingly start liking the idea of Hitler coming to power so if we're going to start brewing therefore I would say you, you're doing it hard harder give him a hard time if you say he's completely responsible at best his incompetence creates the circumstances where other factors <coughs> come to play um and there are credible reasons to suggest that he doesn't want this and he doesn't necessarily support this. Okay. So next on our list is Von Papen. Now, obviously, as I'm sure we are aware, Von Papen has got far more chalks up against his name. Von Papen is <laughs> quite hard to defend Von Papen. We're going to try. 
but we, it's quite hard to because in reality it's quite clear he has no love of democracy it's quite clear he wants to destroy democracy it's quite clear particularly when Schleicher removes him that he is the important force to persuade Hindenburg to get over his hatred and aversion to Hitler and accept Hitler as a um, chancellor and without Pat von Papen doing the explanation, doing the persuasion, the cajoling, you can argue there's not necessarily that um, Hitler will be appointed in, 19, in um, January 1933. So how do we defend him? Well, we have to do two arguments. We have to say, well, actually, he only exists because Hindenburg um, is so weak or Hindenburg is, wants it. And argument two, it's all doomed anyway. You know, he was just... He was following an inevitable trend towards Hitler. He was just another waypoint. He doesn't actively lead it any more than anything else. Both are relatively weak arguments. But the first one. We can say actually von Papen, yes, does not deserve to be Chancellor. But he is everything he does as Chancellor is because he has been put there by Hindenburg and Schleicher. And therefore we can say, is it his fault or is it the people who put him there? Okay, they could have got rid of him. They do eventually get rid of him. Everything he does, Prussian coup, unbanning the SA is actually their fault because they know what he's about he doesn't hide the fact he is an authoritarian they know he's one of them they put him in anyway so is it his fault or is it their fault for putting him in they had the power we could also point out that by 19 for um, he, he's only power for a few months and by 1932 when he's in power germany is already sliding um, there is no middle grain. You have to use Article 48. Be there is no real semblance of democracy. We can also point out that von Papen is having to deal with an economic political crisis that Gruding has created. And we can also say that actually in reality, he uses Article 48, he uses dictatorial powers. But what else choice are there? The country's in a disaster, the politics is chaotic, the right tag is terrible. And actually, as an outsider, the only way to rule is like he did through Article 48 with a cabinet of barons with little caring about democracy. These arguments are not necessarily the most convincing, but these are definitely defences, if not counter arguments. What, so what can we say how he did which made it worse? Well, he reversed the SA ban and actively tried to create an authoritarian state. He actively tried to remove democracy from America. This is clearly very, very bad. We can also argue that he is ev his anti-democratic sort of credentials are evident in the Prussian coup. And you can also point out that from Hindenburg, and this is the defense of Hindenburg, Hindenburg is 85 by 1932, and he's increasingly senile. And we're going to talk about the idea of actually how is, there is a huge debate about how much Hindenburg is aware of what's going on in the last year or two. And we can say that von Papen actually goes from puppet master, um, so from puppet to puppet master, um, and increasingly is able to manipulate Hindenburg himself. If, point to the fact that Hitler gets picked at all shows that it's clearly something's changed Hindenburg's mind because he hated that to quote unquote Austrian corporal so we can say actually von Papen is the power behind the throne working Hindenburg and making all the bad things that Hindenburg does happen so we're going to argue well, it must be Hindenburg because he was the one who put Hitler into power as Chancellor but we can say well in Hindenburg's defence was it Hindenburg or was that von Papen manipulating him we can also point out that um uh, the without von Papen, there's no real chance Hitler will be in power. Von Papen goes to Hitler and persuades Hitler to drop his demand for an enabling law, um, and also persuades Hitler to in, become um, Chancellor, and then runs over to Hindenburg and persuades Hindenburg to pr accept this. He is the deal maker. He is the one making the references. He is the one making the agreements, and therefore we can say actually it's Hitler who does it all. We can also point out that in reality, um, he comes into government with no parts of the Reichstag um, on his side and no real care or willingness to get involved in uh, the Reichstag and therefore we can argue that in reality he has no care about democracy at all. So if we're going to summarize von Papen we need to call him as he is. He is an active waypoint, active force enabling Hitler to come to power. You can argue that the fact that it's got to someone like von Papen becoming Chancellor shows how much economically has gone bad yes but politically as well the fact that we have a situation where Hindenburg's just picking on a whim random people is bad and therefore is it him or is it of wide problems going on but in reality if we are going to say it's someone else's fault we're saying it's someone or something else's fault the great depression Hindenburg or whatever because they get him in this position to do all this stuff right as in if we didn't have the Great Depression, you could argue, well, there's no reason for Van Papen, and then we wouldn't have anyone to persuade Hitler, um, to push Hitler and Hindenburg together. So Van Papen is an important factor. You don't necessarily have to say he is the most important, but he is certainly significant. So let's talk about Schleicher. 
Not much to say about Schleicher because he has one big influence. He's not really that important in power. You can say all he's trying to do, and these are the defenders of Schleicher actually, um, all he's trying to do is improve Germany. Everything he does. And he actually actively tries to go against Hitler by splitting the party, as we should remember from the last lesson. All he's trying to do is create a new consensus. And he's not simply going to try and make a military dictatorship. All he cares about is stability. And that's why he uses Article 48. That's why he replaces chancellors, so on and so on and so on. In reality, he is the key force which um, drives more and more authoritarian leaders. Bruning to von Papen, von Patten to him. He is consistently manipulating Hindenburg and getting Hindenburg to do stuff. And so we can argue all those bad decisions that Hindenburg made, how far are they his, um, Hindenburg's fault and how far are they Schleicher's fault? And finally, we can say he is clearly, he is a military man. He is a gut authoritarian. His ideology is not about democracy. His idea is about authoritarianism. He has no compunction towards authoritarianism. So while he might not have necessarily wanted Hitler to come to power, if you know Hitler is promoted over him, we can point out that Schleicher himself helps the road towards authoritarianism he helps ease the german people into authoritarianism he helps make the clear the path almost for hitler to come this is authoritarian dictator make it more normal more legitimate um through his gut authoritarian meddling in democracy he, his constant meddling his constant happiness to put non-democratic people in power only eases the process because we must make clear hitler, like hitler does not make the radicalism of his ideas hidden some of them hidden, not all of them. But you can argue that the German people over the course of two and a half years, three years, are eased into the idea of Hitler. And you can argue Schleicher, through his support of presidential government, is key to that. Finally, let's look at Hindenburg. Now, Hindenburg has a lot to answer for. Okay, um, We're going to talk about his defences in a second, but every decision that's made in a presidential government by definition is made by him yes individual pr pr um, chancellors might invent the, the idea and Hindenburg has to use article 48 to legitimize it or make it go through but ultimately he is the gatekeeper he is the one who decides if something happens or not and therefore he actually has a lot of either direct or indirect control indirect control by saying yes or no to various ideas and giving article 48 or not or direct by saying we're going to do this here's article 48 so we need to work out to defend him because all power comes from him, etc., 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 and most of this will come around the idea that he's being manipulated or he's just dealing with a bad situation. So either it's not him, it's other people around him, or like given the circumstances, it was an unenviable position and he went against something he, he didn't like to do. So let's go through this. He is clearly an old man. He is constantly manipulated. He's surrounded by various members of the elites, not just the generals and um, von Papa, not just von Papen and Schleicher, but the cabal of Prussian military officers, officers of low ability and high ambition, who constantly see opportunities in persuading Hindenburg that the next most radical person and or and or Hitler is the next person you need to support. So we can say that actually every decision he made is his, but actually it's only because he's being manipulated by others and therefore absolves him of much of the blame. We can also point out that if he was truly just an gut authoritarian who wanted to destroy democracy, why doesn't he destroy it from 1925 when he comes to power? It's only with the Great Depression that and the crisis does he respond um, uh, to uh, the um, uh, to create presidential government. So actually, is he someone who actively wants to lead to Hitler? Or does this give evidence to the argument that actually all he's doing is responding to the economic, political, violent crisis that's happened as a result of the depression and in the only way he knows how, which is through Article 48. And yes, it's not great that he does Article 48 and yes, it legitimises authoritarianism, but what else other choice does he have? And we can point out that von Papen is the one manipulating, von Papen's the one making the deals of Hitler, but Hindenburg has to actively be persuaded to put Hitler into power. It's von Papen, therefore, who's making all the decision, who's trying to grab power, not Hindenburg himself. Hindenburg isn't pro-Hitler. Hindenburg doesn't want Hitler to get power. Hindenburg, as remember, in 1932, does, actively says no to Hitler coming to power. And he doesn't really care about power because he's got as much as he wants. And we can finally point out that, considering how bad Germany was in 1933, that there is no... Who else is going to be chancellor? At least if you had the Nazis, there'd be some stability because at least... 40% of the vote between the Nazis and the DMVP will be on the side of the government, okay, you can argue that that's the most stable and good for Germany course, at least by his look, okay, he 
without without putting Hitler into power, we're just gonna have more violence, more SA, and more Ill- illegitimate ch- chancellors who don't can't make any changes. You put Hitler into power, you either get stability or he discredits himself, and the Nazis lose popularity. For him, it's a win-win. Particularly if you think about it, with all the different rules and controls Hind- um, Hindenburg and von Papen put around Hitler when he comes to power, the cabinet limitations, the consistent, the refusal to give him an enabling act, and therefore making him completely dependent on Hindenburg, as well as um, chance of the um, uh, von Papen as vice chancellor. So how do we therefore argue against him? Because he's a very convincing. Number one, he is a gut authoritarian. He dissolves the Reichstag at will. He hates the SPT and destroys the Mueller coalition as a result of it. He approves of the upper coup, the Prussian coup. And he clearly courts and supports many of the authoritarian arguments and authoritarianism later on in the Prussian government. And then, um, so in the... Um, uh, 1930 to 33 period so in reality he is not this passive oh, I've got a lot of it. he clearly is a, a, inflicting his right wing authoritarian anti-democratic agenda which arguably both enables creates the circumstances in which Hitler is more likely to succeed but also gets the German people more used and ready and normalized to the idea that there will be some sort of authoritarian and therefore once after a couple of years of basically having a dictatorship which is what presidential government is the idea of having Hitler is less alien and less alarming. We can also point out how he is the reason why the last democratically government, elected government failed. And it's his fault for all the political chaos afterwards. And point out that all decisions, all Article 48, all appointments to Chancellor come from him. He is responsible for everything, therefore. We can point out that the only of only president of all of his... Um, uh, only chance of all of his chancellors who is worth a damn... And who actually is the closest democracy is the one that he hates because he does stuff which is semi legitimate and democratic. Um, we can also say, actually, it's not chances manipulating him. Okay. Actually, is it that he is um, uh, picking chances who will do what he wants, who are his puppets? He is, it's not from Papen, it's not Bruning who's a puppet master, it's Hindenburg who's a puppet master. I would say this is more true for Bruning. Less true for the later ones, particularly von Papen, who has a particular way to persuade Hindenburg and a particular respect for Hindenburg for whatever reason. So Hindenburg's inclusion work, because in reality there's arguments for and against. Okay, in reality, there he is surrounded by elites. He is surrounded by individuals who normalise, persuade the idea of working for Hitler well before von Papen. And you can say, well, he's initially resistant. And that shows that at least he doesn't necessarily like the idea of Hitler coming to power and he has positive intent and he can say his first four years in office, he doesn't do anything extreme. Therefore, he actually is a relatively decent you know, man and he can't be blamed directly for deliberately causing Hitler to come to power. And you can say even when he appointed Hitler, he actively disliked Hitler and saw him as a tool to be used. And there, and actually he tried to control this. He, he And all, for all those different controls he put for Hitler in power. So clearly he does not put Hitler in power because he likes Hitler. He's put Hitler in power because either he's been persuaded or he sees no other option. Or both. So these are our real big defences. The counter, without him, there's no way Hitler could become um, Chancellor. Physically. Hit the president both chooses and allows the government, to, uh, chooses the Chancellor and allows the government to continue. Okay? And allows the government to pass laws in the absence of the Reichstag through Article 48. So these are the major leaders. I would say the ones you really want to focus on is von Papen and Hindenburg, but you never know. This Bruning's also nice, always nice to throw in. So let's move over then to the more generic, the more general bodies of the elite. We can also argue that beyond these individuals, the elite as a group, um, and if you remember, these elites are people who very often had a lot of power and control under the Kaiserreich. There's a huge debate if the Kaiserreich was democratic, if it was a dictatorship, or it was an oligarchy. Personally, I support the idea it was an oligarchy. Um, essentially, this is the argument that um, the elites dominated the Kaiserreich, the pre-1918 German state. They had a very good life and they dominated all the positions in um, society. And it being a monarchy, they had a naturally conservative, naturally authoritarian view on everything. And we can point out how in the 15 years during Weimar, there's not been much efforts to replace them. Replace them in the army, replace their control over money, replace their control over land, and so on. And therefore, by these people retain posi- significant positions of power, more than the average person, to have an effect and sway democracy. So we can say that the elites who have this position of power, either institutionally because of their position, or because of their wealth, or both, 
okay that or culture the fact that they're from the right schools and etc because they have all these things they are able to manipulate and use their power which in a way which either directly or indirectly for all the factors that we looked at the start supporting enabling acquiescing etc um get hit into power so what we're going to do is look at different members of the elite and explain how each of these can be blamed for helping hit into power so the first one are the business elites we can point out that numerous members of the industrial class um are responsible for helping um hitler come to power on we, there's a couple of named people here so for example frederick feisen a very early supporter of the nazis um industrial not huge industrious but you know relatively rich enough he is affiliated with the uh, association of german industrialists and he basically inst introduces hitler to the industrialists um, and particularly to these wealthy donors with lots of money but not necessarily much influence it's well worth pointing out that industrialists tend to be conservative but not naturally supportive of the Junkers because the Junkers are very jealous of the um, industrialists they see the industrialists as somewhat sort of petty but nouveau riche so the people who have made their money sort of without class to some extent um, and we can point out therefore that actually because they don't necessarily have the alliance with the DMVP they're more likely to support someone like Hitler who is new and who advocates for rearmament for example okay so we can point out in reality these guys providing and they do for the association of german industrialists provide quite a significant chunk of the funds the nazi party need and as been mentioned before without mass finance you can't afford the mass party the mass propaganda the mass administration the sa etc etc et which made the nazis popular and if they didn't have those things they were no different to any other party so there's no reason why they would be particularly popular so you can say that this money is essential to enable the nazis to exist we can point out how the um, business elite particularly support um, uh, Hitler after Schleicher's crazy scheme to make an alliance of the trade unions and the left of the of the Nazis or the left of the NSDAP sorry um, and therefore we can say actually in reality because of that they increasingly lobby and use their influence to support um, the Nazi claims that they should be in power and we can also point out how in reality people industrious like Paul Vrush and financiers like Kurt von Scholder help um, pave the way for Nazis to rule for using their influence. Rush introduces um, Hitler to various financiers and people who can donate money and um, Schroeder is the actual one who organises the meeting between Hitler and von Papen because obviously they don't know each other. Schroeder is a mutual friend of both and he can say well let us get in a room and have a discussion and it's from that discussion the agreement to make hitler chancellor happens so again they're enabling him to come to power they are providing the networks hitler if you remember is a petty bourgeois lower middle class son of a minor civil servant he is not important and there's no reason he'll mix in these circles the business elite particularly the industrialists really give him the in give him the networks required for the money and the influence we can also point out that particular members of the Junker class um, who are around um, uh, Hit, um, Hitler also help persuade um, <coughs> to around Hindenburg and um, can also have play, play a role in persuading him. And finally, the last bullet point, we can say that particular individuals have a massive role in um, changing the political circumstances. The brutality at which the business elite approach their relations with trade unionists only gather support for the communist party in response they do lots of lockouts they, they um, refuse to pay workers and so on so we can say in reality their brutal treatment leads to an increase in support for um, the communists that in turn only encourages um, f fear of communism that in turn only um, then leads to um, uh, a rise in Nazi support out of fear of communism okay so that can be our argument Therefore, we can argue their indirect action, particularly during the Great Depression where they closed down um, businesses or they treated the workers poorly, helps indirectly lead to Hitler some chancellor. So the business elite really have a lot to answer for, and they're often very often missed out in any argument. There tends to be a focus on the Junkers, the army, and the particular individuals in government. So let's talk about the army. The army is incredibly strong in German politics and society. They have great support. The Germans still retain that Prussian militarism and that respect for obedience and the authority of the government. Many people in the um, in Germany, many men, had fought in World War One, um, and therefore had a sort of respect for the army or that like, pride in the army. And as well as that, they are the ones with the guns, and therefore generally the ones with the guns have an influence because they can always do a coup. 
Um, so they have a lot of influence. They do not love the NSDAP. There are particular members like Bloomberg who are, but in reality, they are conservative. The NSDAP are conservative, great. They are anti treaty of Versailles. The NSDAP are anti treaty of Versailles, great. They are pro expansion because that requires a bigger army and lots of war. So are the NSDAP. So there's areas they agree, but they don't necessarily like the sort of slightly lower middle class grubby feel of the NSDAP. They're far more likely to go with the DMPP. But you can argue in the politically chaotic 1930s with the communists on the rise and a long term hatred of Weimar amongst many in the opposite class, which the NSDAP stands against, they're increasingly willing to, if not actively support and definitely not fight for, they're increasingly willing to sort of give the Nazis a pass, give the Nazis an easier chance of things, to help the Nazis out. Okay, not stand in their way as much. Okay, and as mentioned, there are some individual leaders who are more ambitious, who tend to get more stuff done um, and to help and use their influence, particularly those around the Kaiser, to persuade um, around Hindenburg, to persuade them to take the side. The classic example of the institutional support is the report just before um, Hindenburg um, decides to put Hitler to come into Chancellor, where the army, in a well-timed report, um, states that there's no way the army can, with its limited man size, manpower due to the Treaty of Versailles um, can defend the borders and stop a civil war between the Nazis and the communists. Well, obviously, you have to defend the borders. So that says we have to pick a side. It's a very, they don't say that. Obviously, there's no way they're going to side with the KPD. So by releasing that report, you are at a very politically convenient time. You are saying that we need to um, side and accommodate the Nazis. And remember, for a man like Hindenburg who listens to the army, listens to members of the army and respects members of the army more than average and a man like Hindenburg who is not necessarily persuaded by Hitler this is a big deal we can also move on to the judiciary the judiciary of the judges now the judiciary actually are more divided the judges have different opinions and they do different things they're not a cohesive body however the average judge in Germany is relatively reactionary relatively law and order definitely not a massive fan of the Marxist so they are generally although they are different in what they particularly say or believe we can say that they are united by a common cultural political outlook and they as we have seen before they are massively biased um, towards the right as right wingers and they are more likely to give left right wingers off they're more likely to give right wingers benefit out and they're more likely to punish left wingers particularly communists this naturally helps the Nazis. If you're an SA member and you're beating up a um, communist, you can relatively rely on the fact that you are going to get a better treatment, better sentence, um, more forgiving sentence than um, if a communist had been beaten up. That both means there are more SA members on the street because they're out of prison quicker or they're less likely to get prison, but also means they're more emboldened. If you know you're not going to be punished so much for crime, you're more likely to do it. We can also point out that the judiciary are instrumental in getting Hitler Hitler committed treason in the Munich Putsch. There's no reason he should be out of jail, even by 1933. But yet, because the judge in the case was right-wing, and because the judge in the case was sympathetic, he gave he allowed Hitler to basically give ma ma massive monologues, which we printed and made Hitler a national star. He gave Hitler the smallest possible sentence. He let Hitler have the nicest possible confinement to allow him to write nice Mein Kampf. We can argue that without all of this, there's very much harder for Hitler to create a national party. So there is an individual individual judge not necessarily the whole judiciary but he is re relatively uncontroversial and not particularly different than most judges who actively enable hitler so the institution is more forgiving than of le right-wing transgressions than left-wing ones and therefore will encourage left-wing violence and enable the nazis to continue in the most classic sense by not putting hitler in prison for the rest of his life but more standard on the day-to-day -day violence of the nazi regime which is very important to get support as you'll see next lesson they make sure that the um, uh, they are helpful in encouraging right-wing violence. The next group is the press. Now, naturally, you have SPD press, you have socialist press, you have communist press, and so there's a huge variation. It is not that every newspaper supports the Nazis. But in reality, most of the newspapers are large, particularly those with large circulations, tend to be conservative. Okay, and particularly those are read by people who are not committed to one part or the other. If you are a solid working class communist, you're going to read the communist paper. There's no way you're going to vote for the Nazis ever. Whereas if you are the average middle stand, the average small farmer, the papers you read are probably pro DMVP or DVP, but not necessarily super strongly. Not to the point of 
you know, the sort of people you might change your mind and support the Nazis in the right cir circumstances. Now, the Nazis had newspapers. They were not massively read, and the people who read them are generally people who are already faithful and support the party. The other publications, those particularly of um, the MVP leader, um, Alfred Hugenberg, who controls large swathes of the press, actively help the Nazis rise. Now, for example, Hugenberg really starts giving the um, Nazi party a platform, Nazi party support an opportunity to speak and get support um, as a result of the 1929 anti-young cam pl plan campaign and through the anti-young plan campaign um, he decides it looks a bit lonely and illegitimate if it's only a DMVP campaigning for the anti-young plan referendum and therefore invites Hitler and gives Hitler a platform and very positive write-up in his newspapers so Stuff like this, which only continues because Hugenberg sees the country divided in two. He sees it as either the communists are going to win or the forces of the right. And much like much of the elites, he does not really respect Hitler. But he sees Hitler as a useful tool to get the masses on the right wing support. So his papers naturally are very, very positive and supporting and making Hitler look like a legitimate leader. And so this directly leads to more people looking at Hitler like a legitimate politician and therefore voting for him, helping the Nazis. And this is that they cultivate the news. They have a narrative. The Reds are violent. The Reds are thugs. The right wingers are just defending themselves. So they will naturally present any violence, any stories, any excesses of the Nazis along that line. They'll make it look like, particularly that the SA, make it either not, they won't report it, or they'll make it look like self defense, which means that the worst excesses of the SA are not necessarily felt by the masses. People do not think the Nazis are necessarily thuggish. Okay? Yes, the SA kicked someone's head, and yes, they killed someone, but it was just self defense after a surprise attacks of the Reds. Well, that might not have happened, but if people read it, they believe it. We can also argue that the slow drumbeat since 1918 of the conservative press constantly pushing the stab in the back myth, constantly pushing the opposition to the Weimar, opposition to Treaty of Versailles, constantly exaggerating the, cons the communist um, fears, the fear of communism, the communist revolutionary threat. They are building up this sense of, of Weimar and chaos. They're increasing the alarm, the alienation, the fear of the average German. And in that fear, in that fear of communism, in that sort of fear that, that the culture is being destroyed by the Weimar culture, in this hatred of democracy which is stoked and created and driven by bad news stories for 15 years, now Actually, some people will go and vote for DMVP, but just as many of the people will vote for the Nazis. So you can argue that actually much it increasingly makes the radical platform of the Nazis look less radical as it really persuades the average German that there are systematic problems in Weimar Germany that require an authoritarian solution. Never lose sight for the fact that people don't vote for the Nazis knowing full well, full well that they're authoritarian and they'll destroy democracy. It is these sort of news stories constantly about stab in the back about treaty for side about the communists which can lead many people to to that conclusion and therefore support Hitler. finally it is the local government the civil service and the police particularly the police and local government okay now in reality different police forces different local councils different civil service have massive different attitudes but the police and civil service the civil service the people who sort of run the offices in government are naturally more conservative in the in the Weimar state in their outlook therefore they're naturally much more sympathetic to the um, to the Nazis than they are the left and in many cases or some cases the civil servants and police are actually Nazi members um, Nazi the many the, the average Nazi member is is more more common no, above average members of the Nazi party are um, civil servants or you know police officers particularly lower level civil servants and you can argue they use their influence although most of the time they're low level so like they're a local policeman a local police sergeant a local bureaucrat and they can use their influence to help the Nazis by getting them out of prison or by help um, giving them a favor or chipping them off of information or leaking something to them or so on Generally, however, these groups institutionally accommodate the Nazis. Institutional accommodation is where you don't actively support and campaign, but you do things which make life easier for the Nazis. So, for example, the local police might come to a fight and stand by rather than arrest the SA. They might leak information or not protect SA meetings or issues because they support the Nazis. They might not love the Nazis, but they hate the KPD. And therefore they go, well, tell you what, we'll let the, um, the Nazis beat them up. 
because they deserve it. Likewise, the uh, local civil service might use their influence to give discounts, to give information, to give preferential treatment to the Nazis, not because they are actively supporting, but because they have what we call concordant aims. They don't like communists. Nazis don't like communists. They don't like Weimar democracy. Nazis don't like Weimar democracy. Although they don't necessarily support the Nazis, their aims broadly are similar and they're prepared to give them a pass. Okay? So you can argue that these local level, particularly on the police level, standing by and accommodating that essay violence rather than arresting the essay only enables the essay to continue, only the, enables the an, a, the image that the Nazis are good at, um, are good at the only ones in the, com, um, the KPD, and only encourages further violence and therefore a further sense of chaos as time goes on. Okay, So in reality, you can also argue that they both indirectly aid Nazis and directly aid Nazis at certain points. So, how does this all add in? Now, in reality, there's a huge difference in factors. There are long-term effects of the elites in eroding support for, for the democracy, which then the Nazis take advantage of from 1930 onwards. There's short-term where they actively accommodate Hitler between 1930 and 1933 to make his life easier and to keep his regime going. And you can also argue that um, in the immediate term, they physically appoint him. So this is clearly, uh, therefore, a very, very important factor. We can also, however, all these factors we must point out is there's not a rev there's not Hitler put into power in 1921. So in reality, there's other factors: the Great Depression, the fear of communism, aggravating, pushing, and persuading the elites to increasingly make come to accommodation, support, enable, and eventually place Hitler into power. So in reality, you should never say the elites did it because they like Hitler. The elites do it because of the other situations, the other crises happening at times, which therefore make arguably. The Germans were paranoid, the elites were paranoid, and therefore feeling that they have to make an accommodation with Hitler. As a, again, different elites have different effects, different roles, different importance. The business elite, the judiciary, the army, the police, the press all have different roles. They have different natures of their factors. Some are supporting, some are enabling, etc, etc, etc. The one defence of all the elites put together, individual groups have individual defences. Their big defence, however, how far are these guys acting against the interests of what the 90% want? Or how far do they actually, are they like the average German? Does the average 50% of Germany actually are suspicious of communism, are suspicious of democracy, want to see some sort of more authoritarian system? And it's just that the elites are the ones with the power to help that happen. The average Mittelstand might believe the same thing, but he is in no position to help the Nazis, whereas the elites are. So is the problem the elites? Or is it the wider anti-democratic feeling? Because then you've got to say, well, what caused that wider anti-democratic feeling? And that's your true reason. Okay, it's been a long one. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, goodbye.